All right, my friends, it is time to talk about the brand new video from my friends at Neopunk FM called Something is Happening to Emo, Not Just Twink Death. Now, I have watched this one, and I actually have a lot to say about this. Please stick around. I'm, I'm going to do my very best. Spoiler warning. I have a feeling that what I'm going to say about this video will upset some people, and I'm not joking. I have a lot of thoughts about this that are like genuinely important to me. And so I'm going to try my best to say what I have to say about this video without enraging all of you. I have a feeling I'm going to fail, but I would like you to stick around and listen anyway, because I think it's important. So let's check it out. And by the way, make sure you subscribe to Neil Punk FM because they make some of the very best content on the internet. That's what I think. But let's check this out. Once upon a time, weird kids used to listen to emo music. Emo doesn't require much of an explanation here. Everyone in their the old days of emo. probably knows what we an emo know. kid looks like. Or maybe you've heard an emo song at one point or another. If you're somewhere around our age... Can't believe he called Blink-182 emo. You just misgenred my favorite band, buddy. Not cool. 18 to 24, meaning you're a member of Gen Z, and you were an emo kid in high school, you probably remember emo bands like My Chemical Romance, Pierce the Veil, Paramore, Bring Me the Horizon, and plenty of others. Once again, misgenreing, bring me the horizon. Never emo. Oh, God. I swear to God, Mom. I told you a million times. It's called metalcore, not emo. Now get out of my room and close the door behind you. Oh, I hate you, Mom. You suck. Also, do we have any more Uncrustables left? Emo kids really like this music because they were attracted to the dark and edgy look these bands had and the heavy emotional sound and themes in their music. For a lot yes, of us, it made going through the hellscape of puberty a lot easier. And unlike being an emo kid in the early 2000s when all the millennials were being bullied for being emo kids, the kids who liked emo music in our generation weren't being bullied as badly. <laughs> Close the door all the way, mom. Oh. For us, emo music felt more fun to enjoy when there wasn't a jock and vineyard vines in your ear. Oh, this is all I ever aspired to be is one of the guys in this picture. All I ever wanted to be was the jock in Vineyard Vines stuffing you in your locker. Sadly, I ended up listening to uh, Necrophagist and the Faceless. Um, so my plan went badly wrong. But uh, yeah, there's still time for you to make it happen, right guys? I don't have to give up on my dream. I can bring this look back anytime. But something started to shift as time passed. The vibe surrounding emo. Okay, now here's where it gets interesting, okay? You just got your little emo history lesson, but here's where it gets interesting. Started to change. A lot. And not in a good way. For this, we can blame something we like to call the emo industrial complex. The emo industrial complex. I love this term. Or the EIC. The emo industrial complex created giant music festivals like when we were young. A poorly operated event full of sound issues and cringy out of touch marketing. Events like Emo Night, a traveling DJ experience for millennials with kids who can't. I looked at this picture and I was like, I feel like there's a really good chance that I know somebody in this picture. And then I was like, well, it could be really anybody, right? You could just like face swap this with any of like millions of elder emos and it could have been any of them. So I said, it is possible that I know somebody in this picture and I just don't recognize them. Yeah, that's right. We all know at least five of them. I think go to real concerts anymore. Loads and loads of outdated and lazy merchandise, emo cruises and almost anything else they could. Listen, I say hats off to my friends at Emo's Not Dead. Get the bag. As Ruby Rose says, get the money, sis. If you can make a couple bucks selling Screamo coffee to elder Emo's, I say more power to you. This is Emo capitalism, and I'm here for it. I love it. Shout out to Emo's Not Dead slap the emo label onto even if it had no relevance to emo and this really just scratches the surface older emo culture hasn't completely come to a halt when it comes to resonating with gen z but the emo industrial complex is certainly not worried about recreating what was so good about emo music in our youth so where do all the artsy okay. or weird or now here it is here it is. Here's the real point to this video here. And this is what I have a lot to say about. Okay. In all seriousness, I really do. So again, I'm going to try really hard to talk about this in a way that doesn't enrage everybody. I don't want this to come off as a rant, but check it out. Or alternative emo kids go when all the music that resonates with their feelings and youthful angst has been appropriated by the EIC. Let us point you to a... So where do you go after uh, emo isn't edgy anymore? Where do you go? Style of music that even though grouped in with other emo genres, has shown to be different from the rest of its emo cousins. 
We're talking about scrams. Okay, for anybody who doesn't know, scrams is a term that was originally used as a joke to differentiate real Screamo from mall Screamo, okay? Like back in the day, I believe the person to popularize this was Alex Bigman from Fight Fair back on Viva La Vinyl back in the 2000s. But uh, basically, around the time that people started calling stuff like Hawthorne Heights or whatever, like Screamo, they came up with this term scrams to refer to real Screamo. And I'll give you an example of what real Real Screamo sounds like. Real Screamo sounds like this. Very different from Hawthorne Heights and My Chemical Romance and stuff like that, right? Yeah, page 99, all that kind of stuff. And I have a lot to say about this. I was around for all that stuff. I, my roommate at the time was like very, very, very into this stuff. I saw a ton of these bands. Like I was there from basically day one of this stuff and I have a lot to say about it. Scrams first appeared as a term used on the internet during the early to mid 2000s. It is the black metal of emo. That's an accurate way to say it, yes. It was used to differentiate the music in the screamo genre between its first wave of 90s screamo and the many newer bands with similar styles who were hitting the music scene in the 2000s. Correct. However, the term's definitely been watered down. For example, let's say you're scrolling around on TikTok. I want to know what this TikTok is. I feel like this has to be a troll. There is no way that this girl is actually into this stuff. I hope. I can see a girl posting about how much she loves Scram's music while this loud and chaotic combination of guitars and screaming is playing in the background. She might not be talking about actual 90s screamo. The cool kids say scrams. And since we're tapped in, we'll be saying scrams for the remainder of this video. Okay, so what they're saying, and I, I can't comment on this, but what they're saying is that people are now using the word scrams to refer to stuff other than this kind of sound, which if that's true, I, I don't know. When I talk about scrams, um, I'm talking about like, quote unquote, real screamo, like DIY basement screamo bands that you would see playing in some like crappy, you know, punk rock flop house like the one behind them. That's what I, that's what Scrams is to me. Scrams is known for mixing the personal and emotional lyrical content and strained vocal delivery of emo music with instrumental elements you'd hear in hardcore punk music. This is in correct. In the early 90s, bands such as Heroin and Moss Icon would set the early blueprints for- This is correct. Um, although I have to correct these new jacks. The actual definitive Heroin release was much earlier than this from like 92 or 93. Obviously, they were not alive when this stuff was happening. I was like 14, 15. I was kind of like just getting into hardcore at the time this stuff was happening. And I had a friend who was super into it. And so he got me into it. I want to give you a little bit of context for this. So the dominant version of hardcore at the time was this stuff. This is a good example of it here. Like this is a band called Brothers Keeper from Erie, Pennsylvania. You know, you can see he's wearing like you know, running shoes and a, and a headband and like gym shorts. This was the dominant kind of hardcore at the time. You can see this guy, you know, he's wearing like some fucking Duke hat or something like that. And so everyone was like, this isn't hardcore. These guys are jocks. This, this is metal for jocks. This isn't hardcore. I loved a lot of this stuff and I still do, but you know, they weren't wrong. This stuff was kind of like jock mosh metal. And to give you an idea of what it sounded like, I mean, I've talked about this a million times, but it really is the most important hardcore song of the 90s is Firestorm by Earth Crisis sounded like this. It sounds like metal. It sounds more like Metallica than it does emo, right? Right, so that's what it sounded like. You can see these guys kind of look jockey. And in terms of the aesthetics, everything was like trying very hard to be as corporate as possible, right? Like this is a Brothers Keeper album from the 90s. You know, I mean, the aesthetics are awful, but you can see they're trying very hard to be like slick and corporate and like full color printing and all that kind of stuff. And so there were a lot of people that were saying like, this isn't cool. Hardcore is just turning into this like commercialized metal for jocks. And whether you agree with that or not, I mean, I think there was some validity to it. And so then these bands like Heroin came along. All these bands were from San Diego. The original Screamo bands were all from San Diego. These bands like Heroin and Antioch Arrow, stuff like that came along. This was like my favorite release of this era. Now, this is really cool. This was printed on a brown paper bag, like a lunch sack. And the reason why is not because they were trying to be artsy, although maybe there was a little bit of that, but mostly because like it cost a lot of money to print 
full color covers. And they're like, you know what? It turns out these lunch bags are seven inches wide. So let's just get these. We'll screen print on them, cut it off and put the record in there. So it was actually a really cool, it was very DIY in comparison to, you know, stuff like Earth Crisis. And it sounded like this, which I still think this is one of the most like insane hardcore albums of all time. This shit is just like, it feels like you're like taking a hit of crack. Very, very, very intense. I think this is great. I love this. Getting art kind of black metal vibes. Yeah, it's actually true. So black metal was a reaction to what they thought was like overly commercialized death metal at the time, right? In a lot of ways, I think OG Screamo was a reaction to what they thought was overly commercialized hardcore at the time. And I think both of those were right. To me, when you're evaluating art, the context matters a lot, right? And so first wave or second wave black metal rather in the early nineties was cool because they were like, all this death metal stuff is too technical and it's too polished. Fuck this. We're just going to do some like nasty ass grimy shit that sounds like it was recorded in somebody's basement because like we think that metal is getting too polished. A lot of the Screamo stuff kind of did the same thing. And so the point I want to make is that it was a product of its time and it's a time that really ne it doesn't exist anymore. It was like a particular moment in time. I was there for it and I thought it was really cool. For the scram sound. This made way for the next generation of scrams bands in the early 2000s, like Orchid, Page 99, Jerome's Dream, City of Caterpillar. Yeah, and, and the other thing, so I didn't really like any of these bands. To me, this is like, this was like seven, eight, 10 years after the first wave of Screamo, which to me, even by this point, it was kind of played out. Out. Like by the time Orchid and Page 99 came out, I was kind of over it. Now, these are all cool guys. One thing to note here is that these guys were all from the hardcore scene, a hundred percent. This was like all a product of hardcore. Like emo wasn't a thing back then. Nobody used that word. It wasn't a thing really. Um, not in the nineties or early nineties. Anyway, people didn't really use that word. This was a part of hardcore, like Plain and simple. There was no indie, nothing. Like, this was a part of the hardcore scene. Sui La Loon, and many more that delivered this mixture of heavy and loud sounds with more quiet and melodic ones, usually accompanied by in-your-face vocal delivery that literally screams, I'm f***ed up and I'm going to cry about it. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll play you another video here that's, to me, like, the definitive example of... Um, <laughs> Uh, this is tough to watch. If you want to know what it was like going to early 90s, like, Screamo shows, this would be it. This is from 94. This is a band called Frail from Pennsylvania. This is like the N64 kid freaking out and having a tantrum. His, like, bull haircut is a nice touch. Here's the best part coming up right here. Right here. <laughs> Huh. By the way, before you think that this is some sort of isolated incident, I went to so many shows like this. Like, you see how nobody in the crowd is reacting? It's because every show was like this. Some kid, like, rolling around on the ground and shrieking like his hair is on fire. <laughs> this is like a normal show back then. Another important trope with scrams is the contrast between the instrumentals and the style of the vocals. This usually means vocals being screamed into the mic as viciously and loudly as possible, and the instrumentals often being softer and sounding a bit more sad than harsh. These tools of noise, contrast, and very intimate lyricism are what makes scrams scrams. Basically, scrams is like if you recorded the last screaming match that you had with your parents using yes. your childhood 3DS <laughs> and Accurate. then put the audio of it over guitar demos from your friend that loves title fight. Fast forward to nowadays Very and accurate. the sound of scrams is alive and better than ever. Okay, now here's the part that concerns me. Like legitimately, here's the part that worries me. And I, I have a lot to say about this, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. I'm going to let them talk about this, but this is the part that worries me. Again, I just, I just spent 10 minutes or so telling you why that scene was cool because it was cool at the time. But what I don't think is cool is to see people re sort of reviving that and going down what I would consider to be kind of an unhealthy dysfunctional path. But we'll talk about that in a minute. With modern bands like Catalyst, whose 2021 self-titled debut album serves as a solid example for Gen Z's twist on scrams, highlighting the hardcore roots of the genre and the intentionally lo-fi staticky recording style. And I think we all know how much Gen Z 
By the way, back in the day, nobody recorded that stuff sounding like shit because they wanted to necessarily. It's because nobody had any money and recording stuff was expensive back then. So it was not like an artistic statement necessarily. It was just like, well, we want to make a seven inch. We don't have any money. And if it sounds like shit, whatever, this is the best we could do. Z loves staticky lo-fi stuff. That sounds like shit. You also have the band, Your Arms Are My Cocoon whose self-titled 2020 EP showcases the use of contrast you mentioned earlier. An eight-track if you're lucky. Between its ethereal-sounding instrumentals played side-by-side side with screaming vocals. Their EP also includes electronic music elements, following the theme of Gen Z's love for genre mixing with all kinds of music. Some more examples of modern scrams include bands like Newgrounds Death Rugby, Pianos Become the Teeth, Shin Guard, I Hate Sex, So Without, and of course the band Versus Self. Versus Self in particular is a good example of branch off sounds from emo like Midwest Screamo, a combination of the two most insufferable aspects of emo, Midwest emo and scrams. Okay, so this is kind of getting to my issue here. He said that this band combines Midwest emo with scrams, meaning the two most insufferable branches of emo. And here's the part that I really wanna focus in, okay? I know this is not going to be popular, a lot of people are not going to like what I have to say here, but I genuinely think it's important. He jokingly said that these are the two most insufferable parts of emo, but there's a reason that he said that, and, and it's because it's true. And the reason that I'm saying this is because I think it needs to be said, and we live in an era in which nobody wants to say these kind of things because it's not popular. It's very difficult now to find somebody who's going to keep it real and is going to check you on stuff. I'm going to say it because you guys check me on stuff a lot of times and I appreciate it. And it's my turn to do the same thing. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. With any of these kind of subcultures, there are pros and cons. There's good and bad to it. With something like scrams, like any of these subcultures exist because they make space for a certain kind of person that doesn't feel like they have space anywhere else, right? Like I said before, like 90s hardcore was Earth Crisis and Hate Breed and stuff like that, where it's like, if you were the type of person that didn't want to go to a show full of guys in basketball jerseys punching you in the face, maybe because you were a little bit more artsy or emo or whatever, you know, you didn't feel safe with those shows. And for good reason, you know, those people people sort of carved out their own space. And it was cool at the time because those people needed their space. The problem is that over time, these subcultures end up becoming just sort of a filter bubble of a bunch of people who are all the same type of person with the same type of dysfunctions and character defects and flaws that just sort of feed and enable each other. And so I feel like with scrams in particular, and, and I guess I would say Midwest emo, I think it really creates an atmosphere that enables and almost encourages these kind of dysfunctional aspects. You know, the, the guys at Neopunk FM call it male, male manipulator music. And I think that's right. I think that's what it is. You know, again, I have been around this stuff for 30 years, okay? 30 years, longer than a lot of people watching this have been alive. And I can tell you from experience, the people who kind of go too far down the rabbit hole on this stuff, life did not end well for them. The kind of people that sort of never grew out of Screamo and never grew out of this scene. There are people I know who are like my age in their 40s now that are sort of still living this way and thinking this way. Life didn't turn out well for them. You know, Midwest Emo and Scrams fans are the same as indie rock fans. Not counting a stripper in Baltimore, I've yet to find one that's actually pleasant to be around. It, it's kind of true. There's a lot of people in the scene with some really serious personality disorders. For example, there was this one guy named Sam McFeeders from a band called Born Against, who was brilliant. Brilliant guy in a brilliant band but just absolutely fucking unbearable to be around. Just a total dick. And years later, I heard him on a podcast and he seemed like a really cool, like chill guy. I was like, this is weird. This doesn't feel like the Sam McFeeders that I remember. And he was like, oh, well, you know, I started going to therapy. I'm on medication now. It turns out, I want to say maybe he was bipolar or something. And I was like, oh, back in the day, Sam McFeeders wasn't just like quirky. He was like extremely mentally ill, but the scene just sort of encouraged that. And they're like, oh, Sam is so like wild and crazy. And he says the craziest shit. Sam is so funny. Well, no, he wasn't. I mean, he was funny, but that wasn't Sam being funny 
and being cool. That was Sam being extremely mentally ill. And nobody should want him to stay in that place. But that's the part of this scene that bothers me is that it glorifies and encourages a lot of this like really seriously negative kind of behavior and thinking. And I'll talk about that more, but that's sort of the root of my concern here. Midwest Screamo marks the most incestuous and concentrated form of the contrast in scrams that we've been talking about, swirling together the noodly melodies and math riffs of classic Midwest emo with the harshly desperate screams which define the scram sound. And I'm not telling you, you know, if you listen to scrams or Midwest emo that like, oh, your life is going to be over and it's going to be miserable and, you know, you're doomed to be an unhappy, like miserable, mentally ill person. Obviously, I'm not saying that. My point is, yeah, it's this. People have stopped taking the songs as a way of asking for help and release their traumas and have taken them as just songs instead of what they actually, yeah, that's what it is. It's the same thing as hardcore, okay? Hardcore, like, you know, hate breed type hardcore. You know, that's a very violent culture, right? And if you were to get to know a lot of the people who who are into that stuff, a lot of those people come from physically abusive homes. And the reason why they're attracted to violence is because of that. Because unfortunately, one of the sad aspects of human behavior is that as adults, we oftentimes seek to recreate the things that were traumatic to us when we were kids. So if you were physically abused as a child, like if, you're, if your dad hit you when you were a kid, it's unfortunately very often the case that you were going to grow up and hurt people, right? And that's no judgment. It's just, unfortunately, that's what it is. And so with stuff like this, it's kind of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, I don't mean to be mean, but look at the people in this video. Do these people look well to you? Do these look like the kind of people who, you know, if they continue living this way for five or 10 more years, that that's going to be a good thing for them? I'm not judging them. I'm not putting them down. I'm really not. But the question to ask yourself is, on the one hand, these kind of subcultures create a space for these people who do need it, and that's valuable and important. But on the other hand, at a certain point, it becomes just this sort of thing that actually exaggerates all these negative aspects, right? Like drill rap would be another good example of this, right? It's like, on the one hand, drill rap is like cool, because it creates an opportunity for these people who grew up around a lot of really fucked up violent shit, like, you know, gang warfare and stuff like that, to talk about that and to express their feelings and to be around other people who understand where they came from. On the other hand, at a certain point, if you're one of those people being around more drill rap is the last fucking thing you need, right? Because it just kind of creates more of the same thing that you're trying to escape. Right? That's my point. If music releases dopamine and you feel sad, throw on Midwest emo and get that dopamine hit. I wonder if you start to crave the dopamine rush you associate with being sad tied to the dopamine hit of the music. I mean, that could be. That could be. Trauma can create a warped view of justice. You either become an abuser yourself so you're not alone in your trauma or you make sure it doesn't happen to anyone around you. You know, there's a reason they call this male manipulator music right? Is because there's a lot of those people in this scene, unfortunately. So my point here is that like, I joke about this stuff. I, when I, when I make fun of people on TikTok, I'm like, oh, why are you wasting your youth being into this stuff? I'm joking, but I'm not joking. And that's why the real point is this. You've heard the saying that you are the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. Have you heard that saying? Like, you know, probably your fucking little league coach said it when you were seven years old or something like that. It's true. So ask yourself this when you're talking about genres, like say, you know, stoner rock or doom metal or like depressive suicidal black metal, Midwest emo scrams, like any of these like really, really dark negative kind of genres. You probably got into this kind of music because there is some sort of source of trauma in your life, right? I mean, that's why I got into hardcore and death metal and stuff. Ask yourself this, if it's true that you are the sum of the five people that you hang out with, which I think it is, is it helping you or hurting you to be around these people all the time? And this counts on the internet also, by the way, whether you are hanging out with them in person or online, at the end of the day, these people are going to be an influence on you. And are they a good influence? 
That's the question. I know here's my boomer rant that's probably going to upset a lot of people. They're going to say, well, I listen to this stuff because it's cathartic and it makes me feel good. Cool. I get it. There is some truth to that. But at a certain point, yes, you got to cut the bad fruit off the tree. At a certain point, it no longer becomes healthy especially to spend this much time around it. So that is my boomer rant. Genuinely, like, again, I've been around this stuff for 30 years. I've seen how this movie ends, okay? I've seen how this movie ends. You've been into it for a couple years. I've been around it for 30 years. I've seen how this movie ends, and I'm telling you, it's not a good ending. You don't want to end up that way. If you want to listen to this stuff, go for it, but just... Be careful, pump the brakes, don't go too far down the rabbit hole. That is my opinion. So that does it for this installment of uh, Papa Finn lectures the youth about why they should not listen to emo. <laughs> Join us next time. And uh, also make sure you subscribe to the folks at Neopunk FM. They make some of the absolute best content on the internet. Now get out of my room and close the door behind you. Ugh!